opposite of what the world says we should do. And so they are witnesses, they are signs, they are examples, they are living witnesses to the call that God has put upon these men and women to love him back as much as he loves them. Now, are we all called to that? No. But we are all called to our level of depth relationship. And this is where St. Therese Lisieux and St. Um, Jose Maria Scriva come into play the most. Because both of these saints talked about redeeming, if you will, ordinary life. You and I kind of life. This is why the organization Opus Dei was founded by St. Maria uh, Jose Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei, because it's dedicated to the sanctification of the ordinary life. Because we're all called to this level of depth that we're able to, to follow. Am I making sense here? Yes. yes. Good? All right. So let's move on from that. So this is part of what we've already covered in chapter one. I'm just doing a brief recap of uh, the dialogue goes on. Let's pick it up in chapter two, verse one. The beloved begins in verse one. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley. And the lover responds. As a lily among the brambles, so is my love among the maidens. And then she responds, As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow. His fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins and refresh me with apples for I am sick with love. Oh, that his left hand were under my head and his right hand embraced me. I adjure you, O oh daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the deers of the field, that you stir not up nor awaken love until it please. I'm gonna stop right there. We've, we've gone through our small groups about uh, these phrases and what they mean and so forth. I actually want to take some time and read to you a little bit of what St. Bernard has to say about this very passage. Uh, there's so much that could be said. I just want to give you just a little more of a taste because remember he only did sermons on the first two chapters. So once we leave the second chapter, I'm afraid we have to leave St. Bernard behind us in his depth. But this is what he says about verse one. I am the rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. The bride has decorated their bed with flowers and greenery. She is reminded that she can take no credit for the beauty and fragrance of the plants. Let him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Flowers exist in three places, fields, gardens, and rooms. They naturally grow outdoors in wild areas in cultivated gardens. We cut them and bring them indoors. These cut flowers do not last very long. We need to bring in a fresh supply. If the decorated bed is our conscience covered with good works, you will understand that it is not enough to do this once. It must be continued repeatedly. Do you see how he switches into the analogy of what the song is asking? He's saying, what is this flowers reference? Is it just to be lovely and pretty? He's analogizing that the flowers are our good works. And like our good works, they last for a season, but need to be repeated. You need to constantly refresh them. You see what he means? The flower of good works wilts where it is placed. In the garden and in the field, they continue to bloom and remain attractive. They are carefully cultivated. Wildflowers need no human attention. The field does not need to be plowed, hoed, fertilized, or sown. Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. The rose of Sharon, therefore, did not flower in the room. It is not even a product of a formal garden. 
Its beauty is completely natural. The flower in the room is a good work. In the garden, it is virginity. In the field, it is martyrdom. Wow, talk about a level of depth. I would have never gotten that from reading this. Let me read it again. The flower in the room is a good work. In the garden, it is virginity. In the field, it is martyrdom. So he's talking about where do you see flowers? In a room, in a garden, and in, in, in the field. So each of those represents a different level of commitment one blossoms into, if you will. If it's in the room, if it's in the cultivated area, it's a good work, or it is consecrated virginity. In the field, it's martyrdom. And the wildflowers are the martyrdom, is what he's describing. All three represent the Lord. His personal preference is for the last. I am the rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley. The bride calls attention to the verdant bed. The bridegroom takes her outdoors. This was from Sermon 47 of St. Bernard. 47. Um, again, one verse. The, the, the depth that St. Bernard has in this is really quite astonishing. I, 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 I can't overemphasize enough in just these two chapters, which I feel I'm just breezing over. The level of depth that is in each of these verses is pregnant with just the, 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 the richness of what God is calling us to. So I just want you to say, I just want you to know. Um, so, a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley. And the beloved, the, I'm sorry, the lover describes his beloved as a lily among brambles. So is my love among the maidens. So again, if we assume that this is Solomon writing, you remember that he probably has, well, we don't, if, it, if we take the song, at, at face value, he has 30, and, 30 wives and 50 concubines, I believe, at this point. We know eventually he'll have 300 wives and 700 concubines by the time of the height of his rule. But one, you have to again understand that though that the, he was, these were all technically his wives or his concubines, these were almost all a political arrangement. It was a way of making peace in the region that he was in. He probably never consummated the marriages of probably a third of them, if that, because they weren't of any sort of, they were arranged marriages, many of which I'm sure were arranged by his father David before he was even born. Why? Because that was what, how you made alliances back in those days. Just think about even in modern uh, uh, European history. I mean, the, the kings and queens of England would marry the kings and queens of France in order to keep peace between the two countries. I mean, this was true of Eleanor of Aquitaine and Richard III. You know, they married because it was to keep peace between England and France. It didn't last, but it was an attempt. So it was the same thing back then. These were political alliances. What he is describing here with this young maiden is a love relationship. He's fallen in love with her. And he's describing her as a lily among brambles. Is my love among all the maidens. So all of my political marriages, this is my real love. That's what he's saying. Then she goes on. As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. With great delight I sit in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. And as I mentioned before, um, apples, see back then, you know, they didn't have toothbrushes back in the day. <laughs> the kind of hygiene that we're used to, deodorants, soap, soap, you know, 
back in Solomon's day didn't exist. They had scented oils, they had perfumes, but they didn't have soap like we understand it today. Really, soap wasn't invented. Probably, I would take a guess, um, in the late Middle Ages, as we understand soap. Okay? So, this, the kind of hygiene that we're used to didn't exist back then. It just didn't. And so one of the ways that ancient people got around this would, for example, to prevent bad breath, would be to eat apples. To eat an apple is to counteract the uh, plaque buildup and the morning breath that you have, believe it or not. The enzymes in uh, an apple uh, have a counteractive event and it causes your, your mouth and your breath to be refreshed. So it's not a mistake. It's not just, oh, let's just pick something out of here. They could have easily said tangerines or, or peaches. No, no, apples were specifically used for this kind of hygienic purpose. It was a way of brushing your teeth back in the day, if you will. And so she says, he is an apple tree among the trees of the wood. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. Okay. In some commentaries, what she's describing is the way that he kisses is very sweet because of this use of apples. So in other words, he takes care of himself. And that's very attractive. Because if you didn't take care of yourself, you would smell like you came from the, the stables of the, of the, of the chariots, <laughs> right? And so the fact that he's taking care about how he is smelling, if you will, is very appealing to her. Okay? So again, this is, a, this is, very, this is what is attracting him, uh, him to her. And by extension, uh, men, we can take a lesson here, stay clean and put on aftershave. You know, it's very attractive to women. It just is. Don't like someone smelling like they just stepped off of a tuna bin, you know. Okay? It's true. Am I right, ladies? Yes. Amen. All right. So there you are. Okay. Now, verse 4. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me is love. Now, you've heard that before, I know. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. Remember that song? This is where it, it originates. What is he talking about? Okay. The banqueting table. Okay. This is the feast, the wedding, or not the wedding. It is, a, it is an engagement feast that he is bringing her to. And his banner over her is love. This is a very interesting phrase. It's only, if I'm not mistaken, it's only found in the Song of Solomon. It is a unique title of God. What do you mean, a unique title of God? Well, God goes by many titles in the Old Testament. He will describe himself as for example, in Exodus, I believe it's Exodus 33, 4, I believe. I would have to double check. Let me just, let me just quickly get there. Exodus 33, 4 comes to mind. me until I find it. Uh, 
Exodus 15, 26. If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, I will give heed to his, and give heed to his commandments and keep all of his statutes. I will not bring upon you any of the diseases I brought upon the Egyptian, for I am the Lord who heals you. See how the word Lord is all in capital letters? When you see that in the Old Testament, you know that's the covenant name of God. That's the covenant name of God. What do you mean covenant name of God? What I mean, Exodus 15, 26. I mean, when you see the word Lord all in capitals, it means the, tetragram the tetragrammaton. Write that so that you can actually see it. Y H W H. Typically, it is more commonly understood as Yahweh. Okay, that's what is here. God only uses this name when He makes a covenant. That's why it's called the covenant-making name of God. It's His personal name. If you this is his name. It's a four-letter word. Okay, that's why it's called the tetragrammaton, which just means four-letter word. Okay? And it has why there's no vowels is because in Hebrew they don't have vowels. They just have consonants. So we are guessing what the vowel sounds are in between each of these letters. This has been Germanicized in the, in the form of Jehovah. Jehovah is just a Germanicized version of Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, the name of God. And in Exodus 15, 26, he says, I am the Lord who heals you. I am Jehovah Rapha. That's what that would be in Hebrew, or Yahweh Rapha, which means I am your healer. I am your healer. Like the angel 